out on my webpage in a sort of sensible place. So if you go to this page, which is mlg.eng.cam.ac.uk slash Zubin, uh, it should look like this. And then if you scroll down to talks and tutorials, uh, all three lectures are here. Okay, and this one is called, it's in the same place as the previous one, talks lect 3 sslpdf Okay, you, in lecture three, semi-supervised learning dot PDF. Okay. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about graph-based semi-supervised learning because this was voted, uh, you know, by uh, audience selection, um, and uh, this is a it's a fun topic. It's interesting. I think it's actually uh, reasonably practical. Um, as a refresher, you'll get to hear me talk about fairly non-Bayesian stuff although I can't resist the temptation right at the end to have a little bit of discussion of uh, how we might possibly be able to do this stuff in a Bayesian framework. But almost the whole talk will be pretty non-Bayesian. Okay, so what are we trying to do? In semi-supervised learning, uh, we are motivated by the problem or actually the opportunity that comes from having large amounts of unlabeled data. Okay, so consider, yep, oh, unmute, yes. Okay, you can hear me? Good, thanks. Um, in semi-supervised learning, we're motivated by the opportunity that comes from the fact that in a lot of applications, we have vast amounts of unlabeled data, but small amounts of labeled data. Uh, and in particular, the process of getting good, reliable labels or annotating data tends to be expensive. Um, and we want to be able to have supervised learning methods. Uh, in general, I'm going to talk about essentially discriminative learning methods that can somehow make use of the information about the input distribution that's given by large amounts of unlabeled data. So <clears throat> to motivate a particular example, let's say, uh, think about images on the web. Um, there are lots and lots of images of cats, let's say. Um, and uh, you, know, you could crawl the web for images, but only a very small number of them might actually have proper reliable labels for what you're looking for. Um, so can we use information from large amounts of unlabeled data to help us with um, classification in particular? But we can obviously talk about generalizations to other problems like regression and so on. All right, so let's think about this. Uh, the basic approach that, uh, that we're going to be taking is to make some assumptions about how that unlabeled data influences the class probabilities, okay? So the basic assumption is that there is some information in the data distribution. All right, so consider the following uh, problem. We have two labeled points in the minus class. We have three labeled points in the plus class. And all these black dots are unlabeled points. OK? Now, here is a quiz. This question mark, this point at this location given by the question mark, raise your hand if you think it's in the negative class. <laughs> Come on. Somebody, somebody's a diehard. Uh, yeah, all right. Thank you. OK. We need somebody to pick on. OK. Raise your hand if you think it's in the positive class. All right. Why? Why do we think that? Well, I don't need to you know, belabor this, but clearly 
we are using the fact that we have a lot of unlabeled data to sort of tell us that this point, although in Euclidean space may be more close to the negative points, and clearly a linear uh, classifier would put it well on the side of the negative class, when we take into account the unlabeled points, we see that there are many, many unlabeled points that sort of connect this to a positive class, but there's a big gap that disconnects it from the negative class. That's a basic intuition we are going to try to capture with our semi-supervised learning methods. And there are various ways of thinking about this, but essentially the idea is uh, it can be formulated in several ways. The idea is somehow that um, the label information should propagate through the unlabeled data. And uh, another way to think about this perhaps is uh, that when we are going to measure similarity between data points, we shouldn't ignore the vast amounts of unlabeled data because Perhaps they tell us what a natural way of measuring similarity is. OK, any questions about that? All right, so uh, the outline of the talk is going to be, I'm going to focus uh, mostly on graph-based semi-supervised learning. Then I'm going to talk about active learning in this framework which I think is also very natural and very interesting. I don't know whether you've had any, any lectures on active learning. So I think that will be interesting. And then in the last couple slides, I'll say, all right, everything was completely non-Bayesian. You know, as a Bayesian, can we do something that approaches the nice simplicity and generality of these methods? <coughs> OK, let's go to graph-based semi-supervised learning. The basic idea is uh, we take our data, both the labeled and unlabeled data, and we construct a graph uh, connecting similar data points. So look at this. The data are handwritten images. Um, the things in blue, if you can see them, are labels. A few of the data points are labeled. This this image is labeled 2, that image is labeled 8, etc. But there are a whole bunch of images that are not labeled in this tiny toy example. But we can take a, uh, some sort of similarity metric that operates, in this case, on the raw pixel values of these little images and says that that image is similar to that image. So we connect it in the graph. Perhaps that image is similar to that image, and we connect it in the graph, et cetera. Okay? So now we have a graph, some labeled nodes, and a lot of unlabeled nodes. And what we're going to do with this graph is we're going to put a, uh, a hidden variable, or put a random variable at each node in the graph corresponding to the label of that uh, data point. Some of those random variables will be observed. The labeled ones will be observed. And all the rest will be hidden. And in fact, we can actually interpret this graph uh, in what I'm going to say in a couple of minutes as an undirected graphical model or Markov random field that I've created over my data after observing the data points um, so as to do the semi-supervised classification problem. OK? The intuition that the graph captures is similar data points should have similar labels. All right, so if I know that's got the label 8 and that's similar to that, then perhaps that should have the label 8 as well. And that information should propagate essentially from the labeled data uh, through to the unlabeled data. And clearly, it can go wrong. You can see here that you might then guess that that's an 8 and that's an 8, et cetera. So we have to make sure that that propagation of information doesn't go uh, completely crazy. Uh, the graph encodes the intuition uh, that similar data points have similar labels. 
So uh, the work that I'm going to talk about on graph-based semi-supervised learning is um, work done with uh, Jerry Zhu uh, while he was at CMU and John Lafferty. And uh, at the end of these slides, uh, I have a whole bunch of references, including, for example, a book by Jerry Zhu uh, on the introduction to semi-supervised learning, et cetera. So, uh, uh, there, you can look out for the references. I'll show them to you at the end. All right. So here's a graph, labels, uh, unlabeled nodes. What do we do with it? Okay. Um, so let's consider the binary case. I know I, I was using uh, digits, which have 10 classes. But uh, for now, we consider the binary case. What I'm going to say is going to generalize in a fairly straightforward manner to um, other uh, numbers of classes to discrete class labels. So in terms of notation, I'm going to use L to denote uh, the set of labeled points and U to denote the set of unlabeled points. And my, uh, I'm going to have a total of N points. And the binary labels are just going to be um, vectors, n-dimensional vectors of zeros and ones. That's a full labeling of my n data points. Um, the graph I'm going to represent by an n by n symmetric weight matrix, W. So it's going to be assumed to be uh, a weighted graph where more similar um, pairs of nodes would have a higher weight connecting them. But we also generally want the graph to be sparse. We don't want a fully connected graph because it won't scale very well to large data sets. So uh, although the mathematics doesn't assume sparsity of the uh, connectivity matrix W, um, algorithmically, we're almost always going to end up with a sparse graph. OK? And this is a big uh, assumption. We're going to assume that that graph, that weighted graph is given to us. Okay? So somehow you need to be able to measure um, the similarity between pairs of data points. It's a bit like knowing what the kernel is or something like that. I will talk a bit later about how we can learn um, that graph and the similarity function from data, but that's actually quite thorny. All right, so here's a very simple idea for the binary case. Come up with an energy function. The energy is a function of that binary vector y. And the energy is just 1 half sum over ij wij yi minus yj squared. OK? Now, yi and yj are both binary. So yi minus yj squared, I could uh, equivalently write that as an indicator function for whether yi is uh, the same as yj or yi is different from yj. Uh, and what's going to happen is that if all of these weights are positive, we're going to assume all of them are positive or, or non-negative, um, then this energy function is going to prefer configurations where connected nodes have the same label. So if you get a 1, 1 uh, or a 0, 0, you're happy. You're in a low energy configuration. If you have disagreement, a 1, 0 or then 0, 1, you're unhappy. You have a higher energy configuration. Okay. So naturally, this energy function captures the concept that um, Pairs of data points that have high weights between them uh, should tend to have the same label. All right? So how far can we go with this? Let's think about this. Uh, so we have an energy function. I've rewritten it here. If you had no labeled data in a completely unsupervised setting, then you could find a very happy minimum energy configuration simply by setting all the nodes to either 0 or 1. And the energy will be 0 in that case, clearly. 
And that's the minimum energy configuration that you can get in the uh, completely unsupervised case. And that's not interesting to us because um, you know, that just says, all right, the best thing is everybody belongs to the same class. Right? Um, what we're going to look at is uh, what happens if we take this energy function and now we assume that we have a small number of labeled points where those labeled points are clamped at either the values 0 or 1. So we fix those labeled points at 0 or 1, depending on their label. In this case, we have uh, this data point here, if you can see it, clamped at a 1. And this data point over here is clamped at 0. Okay, It's a bit hard to see, maybe, from the back. All right. And now we're going to say, well, given that I fixed the labels of, of uh, two of these points, what is the minimum energy labeling of all the other nodes in the graph? So for example, if I label everything in the graph uh, in the class 0, except for that one which is clamped, then four edges are unhappy. All the other edges are happy. If all the edges have weight 1, then the energy of this configuration would be 4. Okay. Um, if I use this configuration, um, the energy is 2 because only two, we have only two unhappy edges. And if I do this labeling of the graph, the energy is 1 because I only have one unhappy edge. Okay. So in fact, in this case, the lowest energy configuration is this labeling if I clamp these two points. Yes? Question. I have a question. I mean, I perfectly understand the example. However, if you take, if the matrix uh, graph is based on similarity matrix, basically it would have a complete graph because everything is similar to everything with a certain weight, 1 to 0. Do you make a pruning or you say? Yes, yes. So. Um, you could have, uh, OK, um, conceptually, you could have a, a complete graph, everything connected to everything else, but just the weights getting smaller and smaller for points that are far away. Um, everything I'm going to say holds for the complete graph. You can still find the minimum energy configuration for that graph. But um, algorithmically, it's a really bad idea because we're trying to use large amounts of unlabeled data, we don't want to create an n by n graph if we have a million unlabeled points. Okay? So we prune. There are various ways of pruning the graph or even just forming the graph without ever computing those n by n things by finding the nearest neighbor somehow efficiently and, and using a nearest neighbor graph, let's say. Yes? Um, the weights in this setting are the all equal. In this particular simple example at the bottom, I assumed all the weights were 1. Yeah. Yep? Is there any information theory kind of connection again? There is a lot of uh, interesting connections I'll tell you about in a, in a couple minutes, yes. Um, any other questions? Yeah? It looks like spectral clustering with constraints, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, one way to solve this problem is uh, this particular problem. This isn't the, the final answer that we're going to do. One way to solve this particular problem is through uh, form of graph cuts, but with constraints. Yeah. OK, so this is, this is the intuitive idea here. And, um, and we can uh, formalize this uh, energy function minimization as uh, being uh, identical or isomorphic to the problem of finding <coughs> a maximum a posteriori configuration of these bunch of hidden variables um, in a Markov random field given by this graph. Markov random field um, is uh, an undirected graphical model, where, in this case, with binary variables and the edges correspond to the factors in the factor graph of the undirected graphical model. Um, so anytime you see an energy um, that is uh, bounded 
Delo, you know, so it's a reasonable energy. You can turn it into a probability distribution, assuming that you can normalize this thing by taking e to the minus the energy. This is, I mean, if anybody has a physics background, uh, you know, you often see in statistical physics energy functions and then Gibbs distributions that are obtained by taking e to the minus the energy function at some temperature. Uh, here, without loss of generality, we can just set the temperature equal to one. Okay. So minimizing the energy is equivalent to finding the maximum a posteriori configuration of the following undirected graphical model over my variables given by this probability distribution. And that can be solved with um, graph min cuts, as somebody pointed out. Okay. Now, uh, there, there are some problems with just following this, and this actually uh, is an approach that was suggested by Blum and Chawla, and that we actually followed up on somewhat unsuccessfully in terms of what we were interested in doing. One of the problems is, if, we're go if we want to go beyond the energies and actually find the probability, maybe instead of doing hard labeling, we want to somehow come up with a, a measure of the probability that an unlabeled node belongs to one or the other class, then uh, computing those probabilities is expensive because in general the graph is going to be uh, multiply connected. So if we're going to do something like message passing on the graph, then that's, you know, the exact message passing is expensive. You could do sampling, you could do uh, junction tree algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it's a hard problem in the sense that it's a combinatorial problem. You have two to the n, in general, labelings of n nodes. And although you can find the map configuration efficiently, doing any sort of manipulations with that probability distribution is hard because it's a space of two to the n possible configurations. Um, the multi-class generalization is also a bit messy in this framework and learning that similarity matrix is very hard because uh, the normalizing constant of this probability distribution depends on that similarity matrix and uh, computing that or taking gradients of that is difficult. So for a variety of reasons, which I'm not going to go into in, in any more detail, um, this is a very nice idea, but not simple enough. And we're going to actually simplify this even further. All right? So the way we simplify it is to go from binary variables to Gaussian variables. So we're going to now think of a Gaussian Markov random field over the same uh, nodes in the graph. So remember, this was what I just described. And what we're going to do is replace the binary variables with real variables. Okay, it's a relaxation of the problem in a sense. Now the variables can can live on the reals. In fact, all they're going to do is live on the interval 0, 1 for some interesting reasons. Uh, well, the means are going to live on the interval 0, 1. And this energy function, remember, was a quadratic in the y's. So when we have e to the minus a quadratic, that ends up being a Gaussian. Okay, so let's look at that in a little more detail. So the probability distribution is e to the minus a quadratic in y. I rewrite that quadratic in y here. This notation here just says uh, the probability of the y's is proportional to this, but we're clamping the label points. Okay, so we're conditioning on the labels of the lab label points, taking on the values 0 or 1. And we have uh, here a Gaussian distribution condition on that. And now, uh, if we take this weight matrix and we rewrite this Gaussian distribution in a quadratic form in the y's, we can rewrite this with this matrix delta in here. <coughs> 
okay? So you just take this and through uh, two lines of algebra, we rewrite it as y transpose, <coughs> which is an n by one vector, sorry, um, y, which is an n by one vector transpose, an n by n matrix delta, and that vector y again, okay? Any questions about that? Um, yes. But uh, if you don't have any observation, then this is an improper distribution, right? That's true. This um, is not a Gaussian, yeah. uh, is not a proper Gaussian if you have no labeled observations. The way you can see that, there's a very nice way to see that, is if I have no labeled data, I can add a constant to all the y's, add 17 and a half to all the y's, that doesn't change the energy. The energy only cares about the differences in the y's. Adding the same constant to all the y's doesn't change the energy. That means it doesn't change the probability. And that's very weird because that says that there is, it's an improper distribution with a sort of um, a ridge where the constant vector at, for any constant, the constant vector added to the y's doesn't change the probability. Okay. And the other way to see that is when we rewrite this expression in a matrix form, this matrix delta um, uh, has an eigenvector proportional to the constant vector with zero eigenvalue. Okay. I mean, in a sense, that's the null space of this matrix delta. It's not invertible. Right? But as soon as you have uh, one or more data points, that degree of freedom that, that are labeled, that degree of freedom disappears, and it becomes a proper Gaussian. So it's a funny Gaussian. All right, any other questions? OK, now this matrix delta in here is um, just through the algebra in here, it's obtained by taking your weight matrix uh, and a diagonal matrix, which is simply either the row or column sums of the weight matrix. This is what the diagonal matrix looks like. The uh, off diagonals are all zero, and the diagonal elements are the corresponding, take row sums, for example, of the W matrix. You take D minus W, and that's the matrix delta that appears in here just by algebra. Okay. And that matrix delta has a name. That's called the uh, graph Laplacian. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Now, uh, in particular, we can take that matrix delta and we can decompose it into, if you can see that uh, at the bottom, sorry, the labeled by labeled part, the labeled by unlabeled part and the unlabeled by unlabeled part of the matrix. So it's a take a block decomposition, just reorder the points so that all your label points come first and all your unlabeled points come later. And these uh, sub matrices of this block matrix, uh, I, I'm going to be using in a minute. Okay, questions about that? So um, so let's look at that. That matrix delta is uh, called either the combinatorial or graph Laplacian. Uh, I've described what it is. It's, it takes a weighted graph and uh, it computes a, an m by n matrix on that weighted graph that you can think of as um, uh, the matrix you can think of as an operator that can act on functions on the nodes of the graph. So what do I mean by that? So first of all, I just want to say this graph Laplacian plays the same role on graphs as the Laplace operator plays in other spaces. Um, so for example, in a Cartesian coordinate system, the Laplacian is given by the sum of second partial derivatives of the function. So here's this sort of... Uh, the Laplacian operator acting on a function. Imagine a function of x and y. What the Laplacian operator does is it takes uh, the second derivatives of that function with respect to x at any point and the second derivatives with respect to y at any point, and it sums those two up. Okay? 
So this operator x on functions in general on a space, in a graph, we can think of the nodes uh, of the graph as um, being able to have some function values associated with each of them. So a graph with n nodes, um, you can think of a function, an n-dimensional function living on that um, on the nodes of that graph. And an n by n matrix just acts, it's an operator that acts on that function. And we'll see what it does in, in a minute. But essentially, it enforces, we can use this to enforce a sort of smoothness of that function on the graph. Okay. If we somehow minimize the Laplacian operator acting on functions uh, in a Cartesian coordinate system, then what we get are smooth functions in x and y. If we do the same thing on a graph, we get functions that are smooth with respect to the graph. Is that clear? Because that could be kind of confusing. When I say a function on the graph, just think of it as a vector where each node takes on, it has, uh, holds one of the values of that vector. OK. So, um, so that's just a connection to graph Laplacian. So this joint uh, distribution of all of the y values is given by this uh, as before. And now, uh, as I said, the distribution of y given the label points is Gaussian. And that's great because uh, when we heard from the Gaussian process lecture, we can do all these interesting conditioning operations on a Gaussian uh, very easily. So in fact, we can exactly compute what the distribution on the unlabeled points is, distribution of y unlabeled given y labeled, given the label points. And that's Gaussian with a particular mean, fu, and a particular covariance matrix. OK? And the mean of that function is given by this equation. It's uh, minus delta u, u inverse. Delta u, u is that u by u uh, uh, unlabeled part of the graph Laplacian inverted. Delta u, l, and y, l is the, um, the labeled points. All right? OK, everybody happy? So the mean of that function is what we're going to be paying special attention to. So uh, the mean on the unlabeled points, because everything, uh, the y's are all Gaussian, the mean of a Gaussian is also the maximum of a Gaussian. right? It's also the mode of a Gaussian, that is. And uh, it's also the minimum energy configuration of that Gaussian Markov random field, because the maximum probability configuration is also the minimum energy configuration. And it's unique, OK? Once you have um, at least one labeled point, it becomes unique. And the, this function, this mean function, um, satisfies Laplace's equation. So in fact, it's, a, it's what's called a harmonic function. And this is a very, very nice property. So what does that mean? That this, this means that uh, delta f equals 0. The Laplace operator acting on the n by 1 vector f equals 0 for the solution to this minimization problem. And if I translate, if I, if I unpack the definition of that matrix delta, in terms of the weights. It's only purely defined in terms of the weights. What that means, uh, what it means for a function to be harmonic on the graph is the following property. It means that fi for an unlabeled node is the weighted average of its neighbors. OK, that's what this expression says. Uh, Summing over j, j being neighbors of i, w, i, j, f, j, normalized. This is really cool and really simple. It just says 
if I'm a node on the graph, and I don't know where to sit on this 0, 1 interval for my probability of being in class 1, I look at my neighbors, and I just end up being a weighted average of my neighbors weighted by these Ws. All right? Of course, if I'm a labeled node, I'm stuck at either 0 or 1. But now my neighbors will be influenced by my label. And this, is a, a, you know, this gives you very smooth functions on the graph. And the smoothness is completely determined by this uh, weight matrix W. So any questions about that? <coughs> yes? Yes, the, um, the, uh, you know, given any constraints, um, there is a unique solution to this problem, and the solution is a harmonic function, and that is the mean. So that's, sorry, that's what I, I'm overloading the notation here. Any function that satisfies this satisfies that property, and I'm also saying this mean function satisfies that property. OK, and now the other interesting thing is that if I clamp a few points at 0 or 1, that everywhere, assuming the graph is connected, OK, then uh, all the unlabeled nodes will have a mean that's somewhere between 0 and 1. All right. So I mean, the key of the idea here is very simple. Uh, take your graph. Take your labeled points, solve for the harmonic function for the mean of this thing, which is solving a linear system of equations, and then interpret um, the f value at each node as the probability of belonging to one or the other class. And then do some uh, thresholding classification or something like that on those values if you want. <coughs> OK. Now we can, uh, I think it's important to uh, have uh, additional intuitions about what's going on. And the nice thing is that um, graph Laplacians and harmonic functions have been widely studied in a whole bunch of different fields. So let me just give you a couple of interesting intuitions um, that relate to this. So the mean of uh, that, uh, the, that mean function f has a random walk interpretation in the following way. Take my graph, take the weights in my graph, and for every node, um, normalize the outgoing weights in that node. And think of those as probabilities of transitioning uh, in a random walk on the nodes on this graph, transitioning from i to j. So the probability of transitioning from i to j is wij normalized. OK? Now, all the weights uh, were assumed to be <coughs> non-negative, just to be clear. Now, the harmonic function on this graph can be interpreted as uh, the harmonic function evaluated at node i. Let's say, take node i, this yellow node here, can be interpreted as the probability of reaching a node labeled 1 from node i, following this random walk transition process. So I start at node i, I randomly transition to other unlabeled nodes, and sometimes I hit a node labeled 0, and I stop. But other times when I start from this node i, I hit a node labeled 1, and I stop. And the probability of reaching a node labeled 1 is that function f i that's solved by a linear system of equations. OK? And again, th this gives you an intuition. You're you know, thinking about propagating labels on this graph um, uh, essentially through the neighborhood connectivity. Questions about that? Yep? Can you talk about the uniqueness of the soft label? 
So uniqueness, yeah, yes, it's, well, it's unique in the same, it, because. You're relaxed. Sorry? Because we relaxed. Because we relaxed it to a Gaussian, and therefore we now have, a, it, it's, you know, as a minimization problem, it's a quadratic, very convex minimization problem. And the unique, you know, solution is given by a linear system of equations, which is the, the mode of the Gaussian. But if one of the solutions is to go back to the main problem. Ah, this is assuming you want to go back to the discrete Markov random field problem, then you would have to take those f values and discretize it somehow. But I, I'm not going to take that step. I'm going to stop at the f values. And the way I'm going to discretize those f values will then depend on, for example, the relative losses that I have for different class labels, or I can combine those probabilities with other sorts of information to do my classification. So I'm not thinking about this as an approximate way of solving the discrete problem. I'm just thinking about it as a reformulation of the original problem. Yeah? Would it be also natural to think of it as like a realistic regression problem and then try to model the canonical parameter of exponential family as a dysfunction f? It would be very interesting to do that. I haven't, I haven't really thought much along those lines. But in the original paper, what we do is we do talk about how we would combine this graph-based semi-supervised learning with other discriminative learning methods based on exogenous features that, that we might have of, of the individual data points. So we have some procedures for combining graph-based and other discriminative methods. OK, so this is the interpretation as a random walk. I like it. I mean, it gives me some intuition. I also, I really like this hardware implementation for some reason, this, this, uh, this interpretation as an electric network. So essentially, what you now have is uh, take a, a network of resistors connecting these nodes where the resistance between i and j is 1 over wij. So essentially, if, uh, if the weight is 0, then there is no wire connecting those uh, pair of nodes. This is called the resistive uh, electrical network. And now what we're going to do is we're going to clamp the voltage of uh, some of the nodes at 1, some subset of nodes at 1 clamp the voltage of some of the other subset of uh, nodes at zero in the other class, and then measure the voltage at each one of these nodes in the network. And the solution to our harmonic problem is also a solution to this electric network problem. Okay. So here is a hardware implementation of the semi-supervised learning algorithm, which is completely useless, of course. <laughs> I don't know what A is doing here. <laughs> All right, so now um, let's take our labels F and let's think about how we actually classify those labels. Um, so one naive thing is just take these, um, these function values and threshold them at 0.5, okay? And what we found in practice is that um, that leads to, often it leads to unbalanced classification that doesn't give very good performance, honestly. So uh, in particular, if you have situations where you know something about the, the relative frequencies of the different classes, then um, we can actually uh, constrain our original problem very simply by adding an additional linear constraint that says uh, my labels on the unlabeled points should conform with the known um, frequencies of the classes from some test data or something like that. And that gets rid, this is what uh, we call class mass normalization, that gets rid of a slight kind of instability of the algorithm in terms of these unbalanced data sets. Let me also mention uh, how to generalize this to multiple classes. Um, essentially, the generalization to multiple classes is very straightforward. Um, for every class, you consider whether you're in that the label point is either in that class or not in that class. So it's a one versus all kind of generalization. And you can separately solve all of those linear systems of equations. Actually, you want to solve them simultaneously for efficiency. 
And then what you get is um, a vector at every node of values that sum to one. That ha actually happens to come from the harmonic property. And you interpret that vector as your class probabilities for your k different classes. Uh, it's a bit like thinking of the random walk um, interpretation, but now each class is a different color. And you just ask, what's the probability that if I start at node i, I end up um, hitting this color versus this color versus this color versus this color, OK? All right. So now, how does this actually do? I'll, I'll show you some uh, examples. Um, you know, I, I actually think whenever you know, whenever you show uh, plots of results, it should always be taken anecdotally, okay? Because the space of possible problems one could try things on is absolutely huge, and any paper will only try a small number of those problems, right? So yeah. It's a very, uh, very good question because I actually, when I first started thinking about this, I wanted a Gaussian process solution or a uh, Markov random field solution or something that was based in um, a you know, discrete Markov random field solution or something like that. This is uh, a Gaussian random field rather than a Gaussian process. And the reason for that subtle difference is that the Gaussian process parameterizes the covariance matrix. And here what we're doing is through our, our weights, W, we're parameterizing the inverse covariance matrix. Okay, And um, there are important differences between writing down a model in terms of the inverse covariance matrix versus writing down a model in terms of the covariance matrix. Maybe this is worth explaining, actually. A model in terms of the covariance matrix that would look almost identical to this. Um, I'll just write down, I'll go back to the slide. Let's say I wrote down something in terms of a covariance matrix that look almost identical to this. Um, it has the property that it's uh, coherent under marginalization of nodes. In other words, if I add a new unlabeled point, and then I integrate it out the label of that unlabeled point, it doesn't affect any of my other points. And that's exactly what we don't want. Okay? We want the presence of unlabeled points to influence the labeling on the other points. So somewhat perversely, if you actually try to solve this with the Gaussian process, you actually are unable, in the simplest form, to uh, get any influence of the unlabeled data. I'll come to that point later. Yes? So uh, do we not, uh, uh, do we not uh, have this problem in the end? Uh, uh, we've got uh, Gaussian shapes also. Gaussian what? Yeah, Sorry? Maybe not only the Gaussian shapes, uh, say, Right. You just get Gaussian. No, no, no. This is um, almost, you know, in a sense, almost forget about the Gaussian involved, right? What we have is a procedure where you take any objects you want, images, documents, whatever, you form a graph, you say which ones are labeled 1 and 0, and then for all the other nodes, you get values between 1 and 0. That's what the, the solution here will be values between 1 and 0 then you interpret those values as um, probabilities of belonging to the class 1 and 0. And the, the distributions of features of those images ha have, um, don't have to have anything to do with the Gaussian distribution. Uh, in particular, uh, maybe I show this example from the very beginning. The property this will have is that on data that looks like this, the graph that I form will have lots and lots of connections going from this point to this point. And so with very high confidence, you'll say that that point belongs to the blue positive class. 
okay? But it doesn't assume Gaussian Gaussianity in feature space or anything like that. So we can't say anything about the shape of the distributions. Yeah, you're not modeling the input density at all. You take the input data points, you form a graph, and then you try to label. Okay, so um, sorry, I'm going forward. All right. So here are some results. So this is um, uh, classifying 10 digits, so it's a 10-way classification. On this axis, what we have is the size of the labeled data set. The total data set is 4,000. So for example, if we have, um, say, 20 labeled points, what the method that I just described uh, does is it gives you about 70% accuracy in classification with 20 labeled points and 3,980 unlabeled points, okay? And as you get more and more labeled data, obviously the classification improves and plateaus in some way. And then these uh, different curves are, just for comparison, here is what one nearest neighbor would do, and here is what the method would do if we didn't do the class balancing. So that actually does quite poorly unless we do the class balancing, which is uh, over here, okay? And incidentally, one nearest neighbors is uh, within the family of nearest neighbors method. Methods um, on this data set is the best value of the number of nearest neighbors, and it's quite close to what most discriminative methods would do with that ignore the unlabeled data. But let me show you some more examples like this. So um, here is a 20 news groups data set where we're trying to classify posts about um, PC versus Mac. This is sort of a classic text data set um, based on the bag of words representation for each uh, post to this news group. We form a graph with uh, 1,943 nodes in it. On this axis, what we have is um, the size of the labeled data set again and the accuracy on this axis. So again, with about, uh, let's say here, 40 labeled documents, but uh, you know, almost a couple thousand unlabeled ones, we're getting over 90% accuracy. Whereas if you did um, a voted perceptron or SVM has actually very similar performance in this case, purely on the labeled data, you would be around 75% accuracy. This should, uh, I mean, this is the basic thing that we want out of these methods. We want to be able to show that using the unlabeled data, we can do better than um, a methods, state-of-the-art methods that just use the labeled data. Okay? Uh, yes? So is there any explanation for the dip? Dip at the beginning? Um, I think that's just a, the, that's just a finite, a very small data set effect. Also, the, we've shown error bars here, which are absolutely huge, so that dip can be ignored, I think. All right. Um, so uh, where does the weight matrix come from? Like, have we learned the weight matrix in some way from the data? And this has turned out to be extremely difficult because if we assume we have a very small amount of labeled data and large amounts of unlabeled data, then if we try to learn the weight matrix somehow to do really well on the labeled data that we already have, then almost any method that we try uh, will overfit. Okay? We're, we're in the regime where we're assuming the amount of labeled data is small. So we need kind of a different principle than kind of fit to the label data to learn the weight matrix. So, uh, so just to be clear, what do I mean by the weight matrix? So imagine, for example, the weights between two data points i and j are given by e to the minus some um, distance between the input features for data point i and data point j. And so this is very similar to uh, the parameters of a kernel that you might be trying to learn from the data. So these parameters here in blue could be length scales that weight uh, different 
features of your objects uh, in order to come up with a weight matrix between your data points. So I don't know if this is clear. This is one example of learning parameters of a weight matrix. Here's another simpler example. Let's say you use a k nearest neighbor unweighted graph. So every data point you connect to its k nearest neighbors. What value of k should you use? Okay. Or if for every data point I connect it to all the other data points that uh, are in an epsilon ball, what should the size of that epsilon ball be? All right. These are the sorts of parameters, what we're calling hyperparameters here, of the graph that we want to learn from data. Yeah? Do you consider to have a, just a directed graph or it's, may, or it's indirected graph? Um, in our work, we assume a completely un undirected graph, so symmetric weights. There has been uh, follow-up work that considered generalizing it to directed graphs. And you have an analog of the graph Laplacian for directed graphs as well. Okay. okay, so here's what we're going to, uh, you know, what, one thing we tried uh, was evidence maximization or marginal likelihood maximization within a Gaussian process type framework. But that ended up in a tech report because that just didn't, didn't actually work very well, all right, in this context of semi-supervised learning. Um, the method that we, we described um, is based on this funny idea of minimizing the entropy on the unlabeled points, okay? So what does that mean? That means <coughs> We, we try to find hyperparameters of these weights, um, not so that they predict the label points well, but somehow so that they um, are most confident on the unlabeled points. I think with, with some care, that, that can actually do interesting things. So here is an example uh, in, uh, uh, handwritten digit classification in this particular um, instance, ones versus twos. And here is a, you know, the mean image of a one, here's the mean image of a two. We start with the weights now that we're trying to learn are um, importance of every feature, every pixel, sorry, in computing how similar two images are. So for every pixel, we're going to learn a parameter, which is how important is that pixel. And before learning, all pixels are equally important. After learning, we learn some pattern that seems to actually uh, emphasize areas where the ones and the twos are different from each other. And in particular, the entropy goes down after learning on the unlabeled data and the accuracy goes up fairly significantly from 94 to 98%. So here again is anecdotal evidence, I would say, that this entropy minimization idea or heuristic can be kind of useful for uh, figuring out um, good hyperparameters of this weight. But I say that with great trepidation and, and caution. Okay. All right. Now what I want to show you um, is a very cool application of semi-supervised learning. I'll do that, then we can take a very short break, and then I'll try to finish off, okay? So here's an application I wasn't actually involved in, but some of the, the um, Jerry Zhu was, uh, uh, and John Lafferty were involved in. This is uh, from a paper called Person Identification in Webcam Images. So here's what they did. This was all done at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And at CMU, there, there was this lounge that was um, the grad student lounge, the computer science grad student lounge with a Coke machine. The Coke machine has a webcam built into it. It looks out on to a table. And this webcam is called the free food cam. So grad students can check this webcam to see if anybody has left food on this table, and then they can run and, and, and eat the food, okay? This is what graduate student life is like. Uh, 
as a side effect of this, we have fascinating data that we've collected on people coming into this lounge um, at different times of day and night, of course. Um, and here are just four typical example images. Here is Avram Bloom trying to grab some free food. He's not a grad student <laughs> by any means, but he seems to be interested in the free food as well. OK, uh, so here are some typical example images. What we're trying to do is we're trying to identify the people in the room. OK? And the way we're going to do that, I say we, although I wasn't involved at all. The way they're going to do that is um, through a couple of steps, which I'll explain right now. So first of all, the camera's always pointing in the same direction. So we can uh, subtract a sort of average background image, uh, which looks like this. And that is going to be ignored. You know, It's going to be subtracted out from our images because we care about person identification, not chair identification. Then here's just an example of some of the data that they have. They have, um, uh, they have 10 people that they're trying to identify. And these people uh, come into the room on different days over some period of time. And in total, there are about 5,000 images that are obtained from video sequences of people coming into the room, whatever, grabbing food and leaving. Now, the interesting thing about this data is that it's quite varied, right? This is the typical thing in vision. The illumination obviously varies, but also people wear, hopefully, different clothes on different days. Right? So um, the data was pre-processed to do a foreground extraction. So this is John Lafferty, and that's Jerry Zhu. And then from these foreground images, you could also do uh, face detection and just extract the, the face images. And now what we're going to do is we're going to connect images to other images in a graph. All right. The way we're going to do that is we're going to have several different kinds of neighborhood relationships between images. Um, so one type of neighborhood is a time edge. So this is one example image. This is Nina Balkan, the first author of this paper. And this is a neighbor of image 2910. And it's connected to that by a time edge, because this webcam image was taken very near in time to this webcam image. Um, this webcam image is a neighbor of 2910 through a color edge, because the foreground that was extracted here, uh, Nina's shirt, has the same color as the foreground here. So through some color feature extraction, you can form edges between images that have the same foreground colors. This is another image that's a neighbor of this through a color edge, another color edge. And now this image, where she's wearing different clothes, is actually a neighbor of 2910 through a face edge. So that's a different kind of relationship that says these two faces are similar enough to put an edge between them. OK? So we have time edges, color edges, and face edges. We have 5,000 images, which are 5,000 nodes on a graph. We connect them together. And then we can consider what happens if you walk around on this graph starting from an unlabeled image to see where you end up with a labeled image. So in this particular case, this last image is labeled Jerry. Uh, this image here, which is actually a very difficult image to identify, right? It's, it's Jerry's back, OK? This image here is connected to this image through a color edge. This image is connected to this image through a time edge. These happen nearby in time. This image is connected to this image through a face edge. And this image is connected to this image through a color edge. Okay. And now we know that this image has the label Jerry. And this sort of label propagation idea, or the graph Laplacian, when you solve for the harmonic function, what it will give you 
is a high probability that that's an image of Jerry. Okay? That's the basic intuition. You can turn that into uh, plots in an experiment. So here we have the harmonic function accuracy as a function of number of labeled images. We have 10 people. So 20 labeled images means two images per person. Okay, that's pretty tough, I think, if you try to do this naively. You can get 70% accuracy with two images per person. It only goes up to about 80% with you know, um, more images, like uh, 20 images per person. Question? Yes? Um, ye, good question. The weights on the different kinds of edges um, are, uh, in this case, I'm not sure whether they learn them or they set them by hand. Um, but they could have tried to learn the uh, weights on the different kinds of edges through this entropy minimization framework. I would have to look at the paper to see what exactly they did. Yeah. Yes? Um, you can, uh, I believe what they did, but I would have to check in more detail, is um, they uh, constructed three different graphs and then they combined them into one graph. The simplest form would be just put an edge if one of these or one of these or one of these is close enough. But a more sophisticated, and this is also related to the previous question, more sophisticated thing to do would be to actually learn the relative importance or weights of these three kinds of similarity. I think that would be, and I think they did some of that as well. Questions? Yep. OK, cool. Um, I have some other, I think, interesting stuff to talk about. But I want you guys to have a chance to get up and, and take a break. So why don't you take a? Very short five minute break, and then I'll talk about computation and active learning.